for some reason, um, this podcast I did about a year ago, uh, retitled it and put it back on. It never was off their podcast list, but it was put back as though it was a new show for some reason. And uh, a lot of a lot of people watched it. Um, and a lot of them then came to the talks that I give here. And then many of them wrote to me and said they would like to try to come to class. So let me just say to those people who want to attend this class, it's an eyes open meditation. It is uh, silent. And it precedes this talk for about half an hour to 40 minutes. Uh, it's uh, has an introductory class that's necessary in order to attend. And then you must ask after you've done that class to attend a class and not just assume that it's therefore available to you. My teacher, Rudy, used to say that you can't invite someone to class. They have to ask to be here. And I am uh, following that rule. And then people need an introduction. It's 20 minutes or so of how to draw in the uh, energy, if you will, of this class and how to turn yourself into a inner space and not just an outer addiction and how to learn to be present in yourself. And it's an extraordinary practice. And uh, I've been doing it for, you know, going on 60 plus years almost. So I, it's worth learning. Uh, I will have to get things organized in order to present that class and make it available to you. And I will do that sooner than later in the next week or so. Uh, so I just want, to, if you still come back to these talks, that you will have a way to then come to the practice itself. You know, when I give these talks, I, they're never prepared. I, I, I really, uh, I don't know how to prepare a talk. But I open to guidance as best I can. And, uh, and it comes through. And one word often appears, and this, this week, the word, uh, this day, the word is foreshadow, which is an interesting word because it's really part of the writer's lexicon. If you're a writer, you create this thing in a story of foreshadowing where you present something in the first act that will unfold and have big impact in the third act. And the old sort of joke of it is, if you have a gun in the first act, it will go off in the third act. And if you are uh, watching a movie with some kind of attention, meaning you care about the characters, you care about the story, you care about where it's going to go, you're waiting for the gun to go off with an increasing amount of tension. And rooting for a character, investing in a character, which is like rooting for life to work out for you and investing in your life and everybody around you is the thing that holds it all together that makes you so addicted to the story because you want everyone to have a happy ending. And Hollywood is very good about that. It presents usually a happy, a happy ending or a deep, profound ending. If you're lucky, rarely does that happen. But it gives you something that makes the two hours you spent worth it. And you also need something to make the 50, 100, whatever many years you get on the planet, worth it. you know. And so there is stuff that comes through that's uh, foreshadowing. And of course, the big one we all know is the word that the Buddhists use of impermanence, that it's not going to last. This whole thing is going to, at some point, whether one second or slowly over time, devolve into an unknown reality. Some people tell us what that reality is, and a lot of us line up for believing in it. You know, the heaven idea, the hell idea, the uh, awakening idea, enlightenment, all of these ideas are so potent for us as hopes and uh, things to work toward in life. And most of us have this idea somewhere buried in us that it's not going to end well. There's some kind of something that happens that we die. And unless we have a happy connotation of that death, it's kind of fearsome. And so watching the movie of your life tends to be uh, dramatic. It tends to be full of, oh, no, no, is that going to happen? It's not, I don't hope that doesn't happen. Oh, my God, what's that? that kind of thing 
And then you try to find a way to accommodate it, which a lot of the time is just distraction. Look away. Don't look at that stuff. And and we can be pretty good about that. Life gives us, gives us enough drama and things to be concerned about, and we don't have to think about it. And then you get to the age that some of us sitting here, where distractions are fewer and far between, and the ending is approaching. And it is a dynamic teaching. It's a dynamic teaching of which I have mentioned uh, quite a few pointers along the way in the last year or two, because <laughs> as Blanche and I are aging and all the rest of us are slowly aging, the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel, if you want to put it as light, uh, is, uh, is approaching. And how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with the day-to-day -day reality of foreshadowing? And now we're living in a world in which foreshadowing is coming at us with dramatic force, dramatic force. And, and all you have to do is turn on the news, look out the window at the weather. It's going to be 60 degrees here in March. Um, there's so many pointers to what is happening, and you can only look away so much. You know, if you're going to get up and walk outside and, you know, and it's thunderstorming in, in Los Angeles or whatever, you know things are shifting. And you know they're pointing in a direction that may not be pretty. It's foreshadowing something that's down the road. So there are a lot of plot points that are foreshadowed, but the ultimate foreshadowing is ultimate is death, the end of this whole ride. And that is something that when you get to a certain age, and you know, as I'm definitely there, it's really in front of you. It's in front of you in a profound way. And every day is different. And every day is a bit of a wake up to inevitability and truth, finality. So I would like to think that I have arrived at a place where foreshadowing is a kind of opening to the infinite. But I'm still a human being. I still, for reasons I cannot explain, watch some of the news. I watch the, I read the headlines in the newspaper, and uh, I, I can't watch news about some of the most horrific things going on, the wars that are taking place. But somehow, I have some curiosity about the elector electoral aspect of this country, and it seems to me to have profound impact. Probably, I shouldn't watch that either. But if you want to learn about um, the uh, projection of possibilities in the world, just watch that part of the news. And you start to see a uh, sense of things unfolding that is very dramatic, really unpleasant in some ways. And I won't go into all of the news of this past week, but things that might have happened that would move things into a better climax did not happen and will probably not happen, uh, talking about the courts. And then there was a another thing being presented to the court, which is um, whether or not they should abandon the ban on these devices you put on a regular rifle to turn it into a machine gun. Why they would want to reconstitute or reinstitute that as a possibility for people living in a country where violence is so much of a rising thread is something I don't really understand. But as a foreshadowing of things, it doesn't feel good to me. And so I found that I got tense around that. And that what I had to do is breathe, open my heart, ask for help to surrender, which is a key of this practice, and find an opening that allowed me to go, I will be done, really. That's kind of what it leads to. But, you know, every time you get to a place where foreshadowing grabs you, you either do the work and find some kind of uh, transcendence or separation or a way of looking more deeply so that inevitability of finality overpowers all the little problematic elements like climate change, etc., in the world. And it really does help to a degree. But foreshadowing is somehow sometimes coming at you so strongly in so many ways 
that you're being assaulted by the world unfolding. And uh, one such moment was a week ago or so that I watched a movie again. It was just right after the Oscars, but it was the one I hadn't, after I voted, but I hadn't had a chance to see it. I've already obliterated the title, but you probably can find it easily. It's a movie that's starring uh, Julia Roberts. And Barack Obama and Michelle Obama produced it, which is kind of interesting. And it is a kind of end of the world movie. And the thing that is so potent about it is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of potency in it. It's not an uplifting movie. But what's potent in it is all of our uh, uh, connections to the world, electronic connections, go away. There's no internet. There's no television. There's still electricity for the time being. But somehow or another, you have lost connection. And in losing connection, you are not at all sure of how or why. Is it just you? Is it more people? Is it all around the world? Is it just in the United States? Is it an act of terrorism? You have, and these characters had, no idea. And that lack of knowing, although they're guessing and things that happen and people trying to interact with each other throughout the film, is a, an amazing statement of what it means not to know, not to have a clue, and not to have anywhere to go to get a clue. You're just in it with the people you're with, and you have to find a way to negotiate your lives without all of the outer knowledge that informs us. It's really kind of interesting, because it points to, although the movie doesn't go there, it points to the need for a clarity and a direction that doesn't come from outside, but comes from inside. Inside, we have something that is absolutely uh, comforting. It takes your hand. I've told you this before, when I was in a, watching movies as a child, and I got to that point where I was so scared and couldn't figure out what to do, and I, if I was with my mom, she would take my hand and she would say the title of my book, if, when it will be out at the end of the month. <laughs> but she says, honey, it's only a movie. But sometimes that comfort isn't available from your mom sitting next to you. Sometimes there isn't anybody there to take your hand, other than maybe the people you live with, but who may not be in a position to comfort you. You may be having to become the comforter. And where does your comfort come from in the midst of such dramatic not knowing? And I can only tell you what I've been telling you for 50 plus years, go inside. Find the path to the space of the deep, profound, motherly hug. And it may say something like, it's only a movie. But what it will really do is just give you a sense that this is all a world of manifestation that is happening, and somehow you are a witness to that. You're also a player in it, but you come on stage and you go off stage. You are in the movie, and then you're also the audience for the movie. And right now, we are all watching a movie that perhaps many of us would like not to be watching. It would be nicer if we could just watch... Uh, a Hallmark Hall of Fame, happy what a Thanksgiving movie or Christmas movie. But that's not what's playing in our local theater. What we've got is something very, very dramatic. And the foreshadowing is phenomenal. And it's not good. It's not happy. We're not What you see unfolding is like, wow, what do I want to live in that space? Do I want to live in that world? And then, of course, you start to think about the world, the history of the world, the history of mankind, and you realize it has always been thus. This is the world we live in. All of us have had this exquisite opportunity in the last however many years we've been alive to witness life in a period of generalized calmness, stillness, openness, possibility, moving toward a greater good all of those things. Now, that may not be worldwide. There may be cultures who are, hear me say this and they say, what are you talking about? But in 
American culture, we have had it probably as good as it ever gets on the planet, although it certainly still has possibility of becoming even richer and greater and more beautiful. And that whole possibility may be squelched by events. And if there's ever a rooting interest in my life, it's for let things unfold so that love and care and consciousness and trying to care, trying to be possibly available to all people around us for the greater good, for the good of humanity, let that be the winning final note. Of, I mean, or that's, final is not the case usually, but if it was a Hollywood movie, happy ending. What I would like is next November to have a happy ending. We may or may not. But we're still here, and we still have to find the hug. It's only a movie idea, but more importantly, because it's not just only a movie. It is reality unfolding from some phenomenal source that if you start to dig into source and you go deep enough, it is ultimately assuring. That's my experience. Now, yes, there may be periods where the assurance doesn't appear, where you don't feel handheld, where you kind of have gotten a little older, you go to the movies by yourself and there's nobody there to help you. But it comes back. Go a little deeper, listen to your own past history, watch the journey as it unfolds in front of you, and really feel this source thing that is going, I have been here from the beginning, I will be here past the end, I will be, I am, and I exist everywhere. That kind of awareness, that kind of knowledge is not just an intellectual, com computational sort of fact, it is experiential. It is something in you, in all of us, that is knowable. Now, do you know it? You tell me. I can only say I have worked for years and years, and there is something inside me that can breathe into a space that takes my heart and my hand and says it's only a movie. It comforts me beyond understanding. It also goes away, and then I have to repeat my asking and my, and my reaching out. So it returns over and over. But it is an extraordinary, extraordinary embrace. And it says to you and it says to all of us when you get there, it says, it's okay. It's okay. It may even say, trust me, or don't worry, or just do what you can do to be present in the moment. And I think if there's a real directive that comes out of all of this, and you've heard me say it a few thousand times, it's bring your kindness, your attention, your good person nature, your niceness to the world. And that may not be to the whole world, because obviously you don't have direct access to the whole world in any material way. So bring it to the people around you, people in front of you, the people you can reach out to in the supermarket or wherever. Bring your kindness and your generosity and your goodness to that part of the world. And then as I've spoken about in the last few weeks, because I'm being directed to do this, and so I'm sharing it with you, you can send this kindness and goodness and love into the world itself, into the abstraction, if you will, of the world. But you can reach up, reach out with your heart open and send love wherever it tells you to send it. I've been getting this remarkably strange kind of directive to send love to all of my relatives living and dead and people I know and care about and love. So you guys are part of that list. And it just tells me to do it. And it just brings one person after another, after another. And I don't remember, I don't know whether, I mean, not that I don't remember, but why they mix up the living and the dead, I don't know. But it just says love, love. And I feel, I don't know how or why, cousins who've been dead for 20, 30 years responding. I feel a pop of some kind that people who existed, energy still goes in that direction, whether it's real or my mind creating a you know a universe i don't know but it feels amazing to nurture the all of what brought you into being all of what surrounded you and made you who you are to go to them and love them and thank them
and embrace them and feel the magnitude of what you are as a human being, who you are as a human being. This is an extraordinary thing, guys. It's like we don't have to be passive and inert in life. We can be active with our kindness and with our love and with our generosity of spirit. We can do that. We can go out there and love the enemy, if you will. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you know there's a long list of people like that who could benefit from your uh, effort. And it is an effort. And if you have the time, I know I don't have a, a life anymore where I uh, um, where I have to go to the job every day. I just I have a big full day. And a lot of the time, they just stop me and tell me, do this now. And I go, okay. I have no, no reason not to. And it feels amazing, just amazing to nurture, flower, just bring water into the garden of life and see what happens. Watch where it goes. It's so exquisitely beautiful. And and the universe is, I don't, I don't know if you know these stories about me, but I, I, I have never been a cook my whole life. I've never been a cook. I mean, I can make eggs and tuna fish and things like that, but... Uh, the, the 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 great story, and I probably have told this twelve times on this uh, on these talks, but I was decided at one point to cook for um, the ashram back up in Big India, and I was going to make a big dinner, and it had a bechamel sauce which I'd never made in my life, and I started in the ashram kitchen, which was huge, making this bechamel sauce for dinner, and I I was having the hardest time getting it to work, and I ended up with a lump, this lump that I was supposed to put on whatever it was I was making. And the moment it got really hard, Rudy walked in the door and he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm making sauce for the dinner. He said, well, that's not sauce, that's a lump. And he get, and he literally looked at me and I got, yeah, I know, I don't know. Where, and he said, Yo, what's wrong with you? You don't know how to follow recipes. You don't know how to follow directions. That's always been your problem. You've got to learn how to do it. And he's yelling at me and I'm trying to cook. And then he says, do you know what you're doing? You are putting tension in every bit of that food. Who wants to eat your attention? Nobody wants to eat your attention. You know what they want to eat? Your love. They want to eat your love. So start putting love into that right this minute. And I've never been more tense in my life. And I and he walked out of the room. And I had to take this breath and figure out, how do I do that? How do I do this? And I started going into my heart chakra and opening and opening. And I started finding this love. And I put the love into the bechamel rock and it melted into a sauce it became an amazingly del i don't know how it be it was kind of one of the maybe little miracles of my life but it became delicious and then uh we were visiting ari in uh washington and his wife berju we cooked this incredible dinner from a new york times restaurant uh, recipe and i loved it and she said you could do that you can make that and I, you know, I'm so inspired by her cooking and also George Subkoff's cooking, kind of amazing cooking. And I, uh, I said, I can do this. I can do it. And so I came home with this new idea. I'll show you a picture if I can find it. I came home. Oh, here it is. Right on. Right on. But does it show? That's, that's what I made. It's, it was incredible. It was a, uh, a ground, land, ground a turkey and uh, white bean sauce. And just to prove it, that like getting on the screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I totally, totally changed my life. I am now a cook, but the fact is, while I was cooking that, I found that I didn't know how to follow all the timing directions. You know, after two minutes, put this in. After five minutes, add this or that. And uh, Blanche was with me. She was trying to be a, a help, and she is. A incredible help and and she said you know bruce you're putting as much tension into this into this soup as you did with rudy 50 some years ago you have got to put love into this soup and it was like 50 years i thought i had learned something but what happens is there are these teachings <laughs> way back when that you have to learn sometime before you leave this world so i went out and bought all these little timers so I can now time everything and it will tell me what to do and it will release me from some of the tension of cooking. 
I'm looking at recipes and going to the supermarket and buying things that I think will fit into these meals. All I'm trying to basically say, instead of priding myself on the cooking, although that was amazingly good dinner, <laughs> what, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to tell you is you can reinvent yourself at any moment. You can become somebody you haven't been. And in times where life is hard and days are difficult and the world looks like it's really problematic, cook. For me, make a good dinner, have something that tastes good, have something that nurtures you and nurtures others. Find a way to reinvent yourself because the world that we're facing right now is not going to feel good to us as we are currently. We need to find a way. We have to find a way to become a, uh, a reinvention of ourself and how to become known for ourselves. And then I'm going to share this for everybody around you. People are going to need you to tell them it's only a movie. You have to be the comforter. You have to be the person. And whatever you have to do to remake yourself in order to be that person, go for it. It's good for you. It's good for everyone around you. That's all I can tell you. So the talk for today you know, is... Um, there, there are things that are going to show themselves that are going to reflect a very difficult future. Find the thing inside you that holds your hand and that comforts you and loves you. And it's right there. Go into your heart chakra, go into your belly chakra, dive deep and get comforted by your true being, your true self. End of talk. Um, you know, questions, any, any, <laughs> any questions? I can't see everybody, so you may have to just talk. Shelly. Shelly, I can't hear you, uh, so you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I unmuted, okay. then Mark muted, and then I tried to. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I love I love this talk. Like I love all the talks that you give. And uh, it brings up the like a key question about acceptance versus action. And I know that there is not a, I know you can do both. You can accept and still act. And I know that if you accept, you can do stronger actions, your more potent actions, but still, and you gave us something to do. You gave us that love thing, but sometimes the action, and maybe not for me or you, but maybe for you, because you still have you know, power in the public, but for younger people that can make a difference. Like sometimes we have to act not just on the metaphysical level, we have to act on the physical level to change things. I, and so I, yes, yes. I, I I just don't know. Let me let me just say that uh the the directive for that is not going to come from a cerebral space. You won't be able to think it into being. It will arise from within. The deeper you go, the more directed you will be. And then if you can open and allow yourself to obey the, the, the commands if you're of your deepest self, it may lead to action. It may lead to a specific larger action. It may lead to uh, something like choose this menu for tomorrow. I don't think the universe cares that much about what menu you choose, but it has a real kind of push. And then if your mind can get out of the way, there's a kind of knowing that you have been guided, that you have been directed in a certain way to do something. Sometimes it's very clear and sometimes it's not very clear. You know, you you know my paranoia. I think we talked about it. Uh, when things get really bad here, I want to move to Canada. You know, that's my, I think I've talked about it on these talks, like get out of here, just get out, free yourself. And I don't know if that's the universe saying, get up. Uh, go buy a house now in Canada and be ready to move. Or if it's my fear self going, protect yourself and anybody you can. And then immediately what comes up for me is, but I can't protect everybody. And I love so many people. What do I do? And then this voice came up and said, buy a hotel. Well, you know, buying a hotel or a motel is not, I, even then, I, I, there are just so many people I would want to have available. And then this thing comes up and says, you, there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. Mahatma Gandhi facing his assassin went Om Namah Shivaya. 
peace is the name of the assassin, face reality, face the, the inevitable in whatever way you can. What he did is he went out, Mahatma Gandhi, and peacefully protested the world. And it cost him his life. That is a kind of choice one, one can make. Martin Luther King did exactly the same thing. He took action to express his truth, knowing he might not survive. You know, with this new thing in front of the Supreme Court, if, you know, there may be a lot of armed people out there who don't want people protesting peacefully and who are trying to express themselves. So the reality of the movie gets really tense here. What do I do? Do I put myself in harm's way? Do I not put myself in harm's way? I don't have the answer for that. Bruce wants to run. My psyche and my soul wants to go Om Namah Shivaya. And it's a battle. And I feel the battle internally. I go through it regularly because I'm a storyteller. I'm a narrator. I can create really horrific outcomes from things. And it's just like, well, I can go in that direction. I can go in this direction. And you write the movie that seems to want to be you know, the movie that gets made. But my feeling really deep inside is I don't have an answer, but there is an answer. And you will have to listen moment to moment for what that is. And then as best as you can, being human and real and, and vulnerable and all that stuff, follow the voice that leads you. So if it leads into a pro peaceful protest, go for it. You know, Rudy pushed me a little bit away from protesting. You know, he. For what, I think I described the story where I was trying to turn over a police car in front of a, a speech that Dean Rusk was making at the Hilton Hotel, and police came over on horseback, charged right at me and a few other people. And one took a club and went like that. And if I hadn't pulled my hand out of the way, I would not have had this hand anymore. And that side of the police car was completely dented. And so I would be teaching with one hand. <laughs> but Rudy said, you don't need to do that. Find peace in yourself. Find the peace in yourself. That was really important to me. Whether he'd say that today, I don't know. But the voice that represented and spoke to Rudy is speaking to us. We're not separate from that voice. It wasn't just to Rudy and then to us. It was he was trying to connect us to that space. That's where we have to go. We have to go deep inside, hear the directive, follow it as best we can, and, and forgive yourself for being human, which I have to do regularly because, you know, I'm, I'm human. And I feel all the, the drama of that. But I also feel, I feel um, directed. And so I'm doing the best I can to follow the directions. Does that help at all? A little? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next week is an interesting week. It is, it is my birthday, um, 81st. So it's not exactly a big one, but I guess any birthday at this point is a big one. It's also daylight savings time. So set your clocks, whatever direction you're supposed to set them. It's also the Oscars. So it's a big, big day. And it was going to be the day that I released my book, but according to my editor, it's going to be another few weeks. So I'll talk about that. Down, down the road. Uh, but I just want you to know that um, it feels like a very celebratory day, more sunlight in, at the end of the day. And I'm going to enjoy watching the Oscars. I, I just, I always do. So have a great week. And for those who come to class here, I will buy a nice big chocolate cake or something, and you can have an in-person suite along with the class. I love you all. Thank you for showing up and uh, we'll see you soon.